Man, this is kind of like deja vu all over again. I mean, hurricanes is sort of what we do in the summertime, and this one is no joke, as they say. I mean, a Cat 5 right now is going to make landfall. Probably a little lower than that, maybe a Cat 3, but, man, um, stressful, right? When you're this far out and you're, you're seeing the updates every five minutes, you're talking about 9- and 10-foot storm, storm surge and all that. But there is a football game, and, of course, the NFL must roll on, and the Buccaneers are in New Orleans on Sunday to play the Saints. Well, now they're going to be in New Orleans today because they are bugging out. They are relocating, and with uh, Hurricane Milton expected to make landfall sometime Wednesday, uh, they're going to move their operations to New Orleans, to the New Orleans area, I should say, uh, for the remainder of the week. Uh, that's what the team announced. And they're going to leave this morning. Uh, and they, like I said, they get five days. Uh, the team also set up a total of 200 rooms uh, combined in both the Orlando and Gainesville area for members of the organization who just wanted to evacuate there. So the Glazers and the, the family taking care of all their employees if you wanted to go somewhere to get out of harm's way in Tampa. Um, they secured some rooms for those folks uh, in the organization in uh, Gainesville and Orlando. And so... Lightning are doing the same in Carolina and Raleigh. Yeah, they're in Raleigh, right? Did they leave, did they leave today or did they leave yesterday? I believe that, yeah, I believe they left Monday afternoon okay. or evening, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it's been, you know, it's been crazy. And, and you know, my, my kids and wife were... Wanting to go to Chicago, and they had a flight out today at uh, six or three thirty p.m. But the airport's closing at nine a.m. today uh, in Tampa, at least. And there's still some opportunities in Orlando, so they're weighing a chance to maybe just get out of Dodge and go go anywhere. Um, so that might still happen. I'm probably going to ride it out. You're riding it out in uh, in Brandon, is that right? Yep, yep. We're hunkering down and made all the prep yeah. on Monday, and we'll finish, you know, pulling everything inside on Tuesday. And yeah. Now, do you do uh, do you do shutters on the windows or boards or anything like that? Um, I do not have that in this house. My other house, we had that, but yeah, I don't either. I don't have any. I, you know, sandbags is is my big my big concern, is because uh, the rain. You know, and and it doesn't look a, a good thunderstorm will do this to my lanai with the pool back there. It'll just come over the top, and then you got to worry about the sliding glass doors and stuff. So, uh, not wanting any water in the home. Uh, hoping that uh, some well-placed tarps and sandbags will prevent that. But, you know, um, look, I'm, I'm way inland, and so I don't have to worry about the storm surge. But that's the thing, you know, I, I mean, this could be, if the trajectory is, is not good for Tampa Bay, this could be Tampa Bay's Katrina. Um, you know, the storm surge, if it gets sucked in um, through Tampa, you know, with, with the amount of water that's going to be pushed from the Gulf of Mexico in this thing, it it could put them underwater, you know, put put downtown underwater pretty much. And then you worry about, you know, the, the bridges. They're talking about, you know, in some places being up as much as nine feet of storm surge. I mean, that's an incredible amount. And then, you know, the sad thing is we just had this on the beaches with Helene. I mean, those people have all this stuff dragged out of their soaking homes, even in downtown St. Pete and Snell Island and other places. And some of it hasn't been picked up yet. And they're about to have another, you know, hundred and 40 mile an hour winds cascade through here and blow that stuff everywhere. It's, it's awful. Just awful. Yeah, it is. Now the, you know, the good thing about this storm and, and when I say good thing, I don't mean there it's good, but right. Is that it's not a, it's not a massive big storm. I mean, cat five is wind, cat speed. Five's wind speed. It's not yeah. how big the storm is. Right. The worst of this is going to be wherever the eye hits and then 10 to 20 miles south of the eye. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a huge, I mean, everyone's going to get hurricane force winds, but yeah. where the eye hits and directly south is going to get the worst of it. That's the rest the most damage. Yeah. So if, if the eye hits south of Tampa Bay, Tampa and St. Pete, for the most part, will be spared the massive storm surge. Yeah. They'll still get yep. some. But right. now, if, if the eye hits north of Tampa Bay or into Tampa Bay, then it's really bad for that area. Look now, out, yeah. Obviously, if it hits south of Tampa Bay, now you've got problems in Sarasota and, and Bradenton. And, or, yeah, someone's going to get it. South. But, yes. but it's a little less populated down there than the major metropolitan area of Tampa. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I'm not minimizing what those folks would go through. It's, it's just right now, yep. too far out, too too early to know exactly where the ball, or where the ball, I'm watching football <laughs> as you go. Where the ball, watch the ball, watch the uh, yeah, little ball called, Hurricanes. Um, it, it's it's hard to know exactly where it's going to come ashore, and that's the stressful part. You know, when you live here, um, 
you want to be prepared and you want to know what's the latest information. But if you have it on all day, which I did mistakenly, um, it, it adds to your stress. <laughs> like you can't control what's going to do in the next, you know, 500 miles really. Um, but you know, it's just one of those deals where, you know, you have to, uh, you have to just kind of, you know, follow it along and get prepared. Well, and to add to the stress too, is, you know, if you remember, what was it, Ian, a couple of years ago where it was coming up the side of the state and was supposed to turn into Tampa Bay and then made the turn, you know, down more near, you know, Venice and, and Punta Gorda and all that down there, uh, Port Charlotte area, you know, so you just, you know, even at the last minute, you don't know where it's going. So that, that adds to the stress of, of, of these storms. And, you know, that's why it's so important to, you know, if you're in an evacuation zone, get out. Um, Absolutely. You know, and if you're, if you're staying and, you know, in a safe area, then, you know, you know, pull all your projectiles in and, and, you know, mm -hmm. just be safe about it. Be smart about it. Yeah. Get your sandbags, whatever it is you think you need. And then, you mm -hmm. know, you got to hope for the best. I mean, um, you know, the, the roads going North, I'm up here, you know, uh, in Lutz. And so the veterans expressway, it, it was, it would look like, you know, Armageddon had struck. I mean, seriously, like we were doing five miles an hour mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't have to go that far. I was merely going for a, a hose to, back washed by pool so yeah. i didn't start out with a full pool uh and you know it was just it was incredible i was like wow look at this and then of course southbound it was there was no traffic at all well, i know and someone so, is evacuated from st pete to gainesville and it's taken them over five hours they're still not there is that right wow yeah, yeah that's that's incredible so yeah you got to be careful on the roads and and i know some people are running out of gas they couldn't find it anywhere and you know that can be problematic too so Hopefully you got things secure, and if you're in a place that's not in a flood zone, you can, uh, you know, it, it, at least uh, you know deal with whatever debris and stuff that that, that comes your way. It's not going to be pleasant for anybody, and someone's going to get whacked. But you know, this this has happened so many different times, and I, and and look, this one is targeted right for Tampa Bay, which has been the case before. Um, and the Bucks have been through this several times, um, and and it goes back a ways, but. If you remember, I think you mentioned, uh, was it Ian? I think you mentioned. It wasn't yeah, Ian. I forget the one. Hurricane that, that... Ian was 2022. So they traveled to yeah. South Florida. Yes. And they practiced at the Dolphins facility to get out of the way of it. Mm -hmm. um, and they took along a lot of the families, the players, the coaching staff, a bunch of members yep. of the organization, even pets. They took pets. Luke Gedeke had a black rabbit. This thing was huge, by the way. About as big as Gedeke's. You'd expect Gedeke's rabbit to be named Cletus. So Cletus and the gang went down there and South Florida at the time was kind of out of the storms past or path, but they still got so much rain and there yep. was a feeder ban and they ended up in the hotel they were at, it, it uh, developed some leaks in some of the meeting rooms and stuff. And, um, you know, they, they were trying to get out of the way and they ended up kind of, kind of running into it a little bit. And so when they got home, they were playing the chiefs and they fell behind 21 to three. In the second quarter, they wound up losing 41-31. This is with Brady. And you go back even prior to that, way back to 2017, that was the year they were supposed to open against the Miami Dolphins, and it was postponed due to Hurricane Irma. And they chartered like five planes to Charlotte, North Carolina, so that the players and their families could could kind of ride out that storm. And that was an enormous storm, and it was headed right towards us. I remember Jim Cantore's downtown Tampa, where you never want to see Jim Cantore. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it made this turn, and it, it made landfall south of Tampa. Um, but it was difficult to get some player, to get the players back. And so the NFL gave the Bucks a bye week in week one, and that forced them yep. to play the rest of the season without interruption. And uh, they wound up beating the Dolphins, as a matter of fact, 30-20. to 20. Uh, But that game was postponed until week 11. Yep. And so by that time they played. And then, of course, look, what's interesting about this and sort of just a position is that no city in America has, you know, felt more of the wrath of a hurricane than New Orleans, you know, with Katrina, Katrina in 2005. Mm -hmm. So um, it's ironic a little bit, don't you think, that, I mean, who flees to, to New Orleans for safe haven from a hurricane, right? Um, but here we are, and... Uh, and so now you have a team, of course, that team with the Saints were displaced the entire year. They trained in, in different places like San Antonio and Baton Rouge. They played in Baton Rouge. I did a game there um, at LSU Stadium uh, with the Bucks when they played up that way. I remember driving. I flew into New Orleans and I kind of drove up to Baton Rouge. And, man, the devastation was still many, many months later. Um, because I think they played like in November 
and it, it was just incredible how much water had been through there. You could see the water lines on homes and just, mm-hmm. you know, uh, all the windows blown out of, of high rises downtown, um, just wiped out that city. And that, that's what you worry about. You worry about, you know, this being Tampa's Katrina, but, um, but yeah, if, if there's a fan base in a city that can, uh, appreciate sort of what this angst is, it's, uh, it's New Orleans who've been through this many times, but none worse than 2005. I think something like close to 4,000, no, 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 I'm sorry, let me get this right. Close to 1,400 people died in that storm. And the, uh, you know, the, the uh, cost of it was in the, I think, 200 billion range or some 140 billion yeah. range or well, something like that. And we're we are, you know, lucky but uh, you know our state leaders for many many years now have learned. And, right. and even before Katrina they were better off but you know declare emergencies early, get evacuation mm-hmm. orders out. New Orleans was kind of, you know, oh that's never going to happen to us. And you know yeah. because it hadn't for yeah. a long time and and yeah. the leaders there from the local to the state level just failed. New Orleans and national and, and, and FEMA, FEMA was there. a disaster back mm-hmm. then too, as I recall. Now FEMA was a disaster, but you know, a lot of them blamed a lot of the prep stuff for FEMA when FEMA can't go in there until it's declared an emergency, which That's the true. governor Blanco never did. And Ray oh, Nagin, okay. the mayor never did. And gotcha. you know, like Mike Brown didn't do a great job at FEMA after the fact, but mm. so much of it was with the foundation was laid beforehand that the state leaders didn't and the city leaders did nothing. And, you know, it was just a, it was a calamity on all sides, you know, all levels of, of government and support. And, you know, and, and luckily, Florida has always been better at that and, you know, has always heeded those warnings and, and been more proactive with things. And, and particularly since Katrina, you know, most places have as well. But, um, you know, we're lucky that that, you know, whether, you know, and it doesn't matter who's been in the governor's chair, you know it's not political. It's about, you know, saving lives and protecting the citizens of Florida. And, you know, they do a, they do a pretty good job of that. I mean, you know, you obviously can't stop hurricanes and storm surges and, and wind, but, you know, yeah. trying to, to get people to safety and, and to you know, get sandbags out there and the closer closings and, you know, all that, all the stuff that they do before a storm is, is, is pretty good in the state. Yeah. It, it's unfortunate. And I, you know, I don't know where anybody falls on, on, uh, climate change all i know is this that i've lived here my whole life i was born here and of late and and i could document this but i don't have the information in front of me but like almost every hurricane seems to to make landfall at minimum as a cat three you know and it used not to be the case i mean there were hurricanes all the time and i remember 2004 we had we had four of them across the state um, and Charlie, remember Charlie was another one that was headed to Tampa Bay and it was a small but powerful storm and it ended up turning a little bit South and then went right over celebration. That's when the bucks, it was ironic. They sent everybody home to get their wives and family to get them out of harm's way. Cause it was headed to Tampa and drove them back over to the celebration hotel. That hurricane literally went over the top of celebration, Florida, and, uh, they were hunkered down in the basement. So you just never know. Um, but every one of these storms, I mean, it's just, it's incredible just how, you know, powerful they all are now. And look, it's the water temperature. If you look at the Gulf of Mexico and you see how hot it is this late in the summer, um, it's not a coincidence. It's like jet fuel. And, uh, we saw that with this hurricane when it got, you know, over the Gulf, warm Gulf waters. So it's unfortunate. Um, it's something that, uh, I've lived with my whole life and always wanted to live on the water. And then every summer when, when we get to hurricane season, I, I always appreciate the fact that uh, I don't have the stress of that um, because, you know, God bless them. Those people have lost so much out there, but it, it, there's nothing more beautiful in Florida than to be, you know, watching a sunset, be on the beach, um, live out there, live on the water, have a boat, like all that stuff. And and yet, you know, this, this is what can happen. So hopefully you guys are, uh, had made plans and you're hunkering down and you're enjoying the podcast. We've got some mailbag questions today to get to. Uh, because there still is a lot of interest in, of course, the Bucks, the Rays. Um, I'm going to talk to Mark Tompkin tomorrow, as a matter of fact, do a wrap-up on the Rays season with that. So your met back questions coming up, but first, maybe a couple days before they are uh, able to be open, but uh, when you, this is all said and done and the sun comes back out shining, make sure you get over to International Plaza Mall and visit our friends at Breitling Boutique. You want to talk about great Swiss watches They've been in business for 140 years, 
They've been at the uh, International Plaza Mall for about five. And right now, look, I know you're an NFL fan. You're listening to this podcast. You might be a Bucks fan, maybe from someplace else. Well, Breitling Boutique is celebrating the NFL's 104th year anniversary with your favorite team. They have this exclusive Chronomat collection of these beautiful watches. It's the first of their kind. I'm telling you, uh, these things are beautiful. I'm staring right now. One of my favorites, not my favorite team because I don't have a team. Used to when I was a kid, but the Miami Dolphins, uh, this watch has the aquamarine face on it. Little Dolphins logo in there. Uh, these Chronomats are special anyway. Now you have your choice of 32 teams in the NFL to celebrate the NFL's 104th year anniversary at Breitling Boutique. You can call, make an appointment if you want to. Uh, their number is 813-350-9374. Uh, or just stop by, man. You have to see this beautiful store. Go in, have a drink, spend some time there. They're going to hook you up with a beautiful watch. And even if you don't want to be part of this 104th year anniversary uh, of the NFL, they've got all kinds of watches. Uh, you know, the Navitimers, the Divers watches, all the you name it. And uh, watches for men and women. And for your wife or girlfriend, women on the go, these things are very durable. They're stable and they're gorgeous. And you want to make sure you check them all out. Breitling Boutique, International Plaza Mall. Tell them Rick and Steve Bursnick sent you. All right, we got some mailbag questions coming your way. Let's get started. All right, we'll start with Ellis, who says, which played a bigger factor in Thursday night's debacle, injuries or defensive scheme? Well, I I mean, listen, I, I think that they're, they're kind of go hand in glove in this sense, in, in that um, – you know, it's about it's about the the players, not the plays. You got to put guys in positions of doing what they can do, right? So you don't want to ask somebody to do something they're not capable of. I would say that that a good portion of it was injuries, simply because look, they they lack speed, uh, especially at the inside linebacker position, and and you know they they kind of had gotten into a nice platoon situation with KJ Britt and with Servassier Dennis, and unfortunately in that game, Servassier. Uh, got hurt. Now the game before, you know, that they won handily over Philadelphia. Uh, I think he played more than 50% of the snaps and, you know, just really good in coverage, good tackler, sure, sure tackler and all that. Uh, but unfortunately he's had a bit of a shoulder injury going back into the summer that the Bucks were aware of. He aggravated that. And so KJ Britt had to stay in the game and play all but about maybe five or six snaps. And that put him in, in coverage. Now he's a pretty good zone coverage guy, uh, but just doesn't have the speed, you know, and, and even though Levante David still makes a ton of splash plays and he frankly should have had the game ceiling interception in that one, you know, he, he's at 34, he's not as fast as he was at 24. So, you know, when you combine those two, um, you're lacking some coverage ability in the middle of the field. And then, you know, to, to make it worse down the middle is Antoine Winfield Jr. is out. And in that game, Jordan Whitehead got injured and he had to come out. So you had two new safeties. Uh, you're missing a linebacker. And so what did Kirk Cousins do? He's no dummy. You know, of his 509 yards, I think like almost 400 of it was over the middle of the field. He was attacking the middle of that field where the linebackers drops between the linebackers and the safeties and chewed them up pretty good. So uh, I think injuries led to, you know, how schematically they were disadvantaged and you got to credit, um, you know, you have to credit them for, you know, for really going after Kirk Cousins for, you know, going after the Bucks, uh, part of the field that, uh, you know, that they were weakened. And, um, you know, and having said all that, I still don't think it was totally on the defense because, you know, the offense scored 24 points in the first half and they only had two field goals kicked in the second half. And then when Levante gets the interception, as I said before, I'm going downstairs, this game is over. It's over. And then, of course, they get the holding penalty and they miss the face mask. And now they're out of field goal range. The punt goes in the end zone. And, you know, before you know it, um, they've got the ball and, and Kirk Cousins is able to lead them down and tie the game with a field goal. So it was a it was a team effort and it was it was a difficult loss and one that can stick with you. Um, and now the Bucks have to overcome this hurricane situation and being displaced and find a way to get a win against New Orleans because, you know, I always said when they went into this stretch, if they could get one of the two on the road against the NFC South, they would still be in really good shape. Um, and they got a lot of difficult games coming up down, you know, with Baltimore and they, they got to go to Kansas City themselves and then a short week come home against San Francisco. So there's a lot that they still have in front of them that's going to be difficult. But that's why 
uh, you know, this Saints game is so important. Craig in Vegas tweeted, Todd Bowles is now 0-3 on Thursday games. I know it's rough on players turn around and play on a short week, but they have been doing this for three plus years now. What has to change for them to win on Thursday? Stay safe, everyone. Items can be replaced, not you. My prayers to my city of Tampa. Yeah, amen, brother. Yeah, that's exactly right. They can be replaced, um, and we want to make sure everybody is safe. And, I, you know, I, I don't know necessarily, like, if it's something that, that Todd Bowles is doing wrong in preparation. I mean, to, to begin with, all the teams, you know, find themselves in the same situation. Like, they cannot uh, practice, you know, when you only have three days to prepare, especially if you're the road team. No one's putting on the pads. Uh, no one's running. You got to give these guys their bodies back. And they're not even going to be ready to go really on Thursday, but it is what it is. And and so th- they're all glorified walkthroughs, you know. And I'd have to go back and look at those three games and who the opponent was. And, you know, with, with the Bucks, I just think that they've been so beat up on the defensive side in particular um, that that has really, you know, compounded things for them. And when you have a short week, guys can't get healthy. They can't get back in a short week. Um, so that's a problem, too. But I, I don't know that I should. you should hang anything particularly on Bowles. You know, he approaches each game about the same, I and mean, he's about as steady as a head coach as is going to be in terms of temperament. Um, you know, and I haven't, I haven't found anything that's different or deficient about their Thursday night preparation than other teams. I just think that, you know, small sample size is three years. And you know what? You've, you've played some pretty good opponents, and you played them on the road. And it's hard to win in the NFL. I think people take for granted, you know, when you start out three and one or, you know, whatever it is, like, I think people take for granted that you're not just going to win every week, you know, and, and that's why like the loss to Denver was shocking. But, but really when you go back and, and look at the game and you say, well, you know, one team was prepared to play and they got NFL players and the other team wasn't. And that's sort of what it is in the NFL for it's a week to week league. And so you can't take anything for granted. It doesn't matter whether you play Monday night, Thursday night, Sunday night, Sunday afternoon, uh, Christmas day, like you better be prepared. Um, and is there something in particular about Thursday that Todd's not preparing them for? I doubt it, but it's not the, you know, it definitely is not the full week of preparation that you get, uh, when games are on Sunday or Monday. Um, so it's something to look into, but I, I haven't found a theme or something that would stand out and say, aha, this is what they're not doing, and that's why they, they're flat on Thursday nights. So I just think, listen, they should have won that game. Um, and if they do, we're talking about them being one and two, and maybe it's not as big a deal. You know, uh, my good friend Tom Moore, who I quote all the time because I wrote his wrote a book with him called The Player's Coach, and what he said to me the other day, I was talking about this very game with him, and he said, you know, it's like I say, and it's in the book, he goes, the team that plays the hardest, the longest – is the one that wins. Well, guess what? That was Atlanta. I mean, the Bucks played really hard. They didn't play hard long enough. And Atlanta did. Atlanta kept playing as hard as they could play until overtime and won the game. So uh, sometimes that's what it comes down to. David tweeted, says the Bucks rookies really cost us in late in the Falcons game. Now I know why Brady hated playing rookies. Baker is almost 30 and he has a lot of experience winning in this league. Should he be a more vocal leader, especially late in games? Maybe have a little more laser focus guys to him? Um, well, listen, first of all, you got to consider where Tom was in his career. I mean, when he got here, he was, you know, at the end, he played three more seasons. But when you're 42 years old, yeah, you probably don't have a lot of tolerance for young players. Um, because you're not buying green bananas. You want to win. You want to win now. And, you know, the one thing about veteran players is they they kind of, you, you know, you do get calluses. You kind of know the game, right? You know how it's supposed to feel. You know how it's supposed to look like. You know what areas of the field you're supposed to be. We're talking mostly receivers here um, that he would get sort of upset with, uh, especially young guys. You know, if Tom, if Tom didn't trust you, he used to tell the coaches, you can put that guy on the field, but I ain't throwing him the ball, you know? And, and, and that's sort of how he operated. You know, he was a zero sum quarterback, like you better produce, I'm going to put you in a position to succeed, but you got to catch the ball and you got to make plays for me to, to feel good about it. So, um, I don't know, you know, 
look, this is the second youngest team in the NFL. So you're not going to have anything close to what Brady had where just a lot of dudes that have won a lot of games that play a lot of football. There's no Gronk on this team. There's no Antonio Brown, you know, that just know how to win. Um, now there's some Super Bowl champions on this team that played with Brady that know how to win. And, you know, they're still, we all know who they are, the Chris Godwins and the Mike Evans and Levante Davis and guys like that. So that, that's a good thing. Um, but laser focus. Yeah. You got to finish games. And, and sometimes in this league, when you're young, you don't know how to do that. Uh, you know, you got to be smart. You got to play hard. And like I said, sometimes the team that goes the hardest, longest wins, but you also need to play smart football. And I didn't think that the, at, at the end of that game, they, they did about, if they'd have done any one of five things, right. They walk out of there with a victory. And there we still talking about Thursday night. Um, but they weren't able to do it, you know, right down to having a chance to pin them deep with a punt, they kick in the end zone for a touchback. Like those little things add up. If, if, if you have a team that can take advantage of them and you're the hungrier team and, I, I kind of felt that's that's what happened. You know, Atlanta never stopped, and, and I thought the game was over, and I think the Bucks may have thought it was over too when Levante picked that ball off. But you know what? Atlanta kept playing, and that may be a function of the fact that you have a young team, uh, you know, that is, is still learning that about the NFL. You know, maybe in college you kind of like, oh, we got this one in the bag. In the NFL, not so much, man. You, you got to play a full 60 minutes. So – those are hard lessons and, you know, they're, they're going to have to, you know, reset and, and next time they're in that situation, do a better job of closing it out. And it's, it's a team thing because the defense could have done it. Special teams could have helped. The offense certainly could have finished it with a first down and, and no one got the job done. So they got to look at the, they got each got to look at themselves and try to try to play better as a team. David emailed, says, just stop what you're doing right now and go watch Baker Mayfield dis disguised as Gus Swayze, hosted by Eli Manning. It's amazing and hilarious. It is, and I have. And Gus Swayze it is pretty much how we should refer to Baker from here on out. Because, well, first of all, a couple of things. So, so this was like preseason. There's like a tour of the facility. And, mm -hmm. of course, Eli Manning has this thing, you know, where he was Chad Powers a year ago. He went and... Yep worked out at college and they put him in disguise and no one knew he was so funny. He was like, oh, run fast, Chad, run fast, fast, Chad, fast, Chad. You know, he, and he got out there and he started throwing the ball and like the, it was at uh, Penn state, I believe, wasn't it? Or one of those college, yes, I it was, it was college. Penn state. Yeah. Yep. It was yep. Penn state. And uh, the coaches were like, is this guy for real? And they're like, he's kind of old. And then they saw his arm and they're like, eh, yeah, it's pretty good actually. You know, like, <laughs> and uh, it was just, and then he rips off the, you know, the makeup and the, the rubber mask and all that stuff. Well, that similar thing happened with Baker, and they had him join in a bunch of uh, super fans to get a tour of the facility. Uh, and I still thought he looked just like Baker. <laughs> I don't know. I could be wrong. But, uh, you know, they made him a little pudgier, changed his nose, uh, you know, hairline, all that stuff. And then they got to the indoor facility, and they said, well, let's throw some footballs. Let's see how far you can throw it, you know. And then Baker winds up, and he throws them about 55 in the air. <laughs> and he's like, whoa. And then he, then he – takes off his disguise and stuff but it's really well done and uh yeah i you gotta watch it um yeah gus that's 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 really what we should call him is gus from now on but it was it was a fun time and baker's a good sport you know because this took some time in the makeup chair it wasn't like hey you got a few minutes bake we're gonna have some people here we want to want to dress you up for halloween it was a little more than that and and he's a good sport about it and that, that's what made it so entertaining. So they do a great job. Omaha, Omaha Productions there with uh, Peyton and Eli. Of course, they got the Manning cast and, and all of that. But, uh, yeah, check it out. It's on social media. I think the Bucks have re reposted it. And uh, you get to see them. It's, it's fun. Hey, those are great questions. Uh, if you got more for us, you can send those to us anytime on Twitter or X at Sports Day TV. You can reach me on Twitter or X at NFL Stroud or my email address is rstroud at tampabay.com. Going to talk a little Rays baseball tomorrow with Mark Tompkin of the Tampa Bay Times, who is relocating himself. He is the place at the beach. You get to see the Sunset Theater if you follow Mark. And uh, we'll talk to him. Uh, about the Rays in this season and what their plans are for 2025. So uh, make sure that you guys hunker down, stay safe, 
Uh, if you have to evacuate, for goodness sakes, do it. Uh, this is not one that you want to challenge. It's going to be a very big storm, a lot of storm surge, and, and hopefully we get a break and everybody's safe here in Tampa Bay. Uh, join us tomorrow. We'll talk to Mark. Thanks for listening. And remember, go see our friends at Breitling Boutique. They got the uh, beautiful uh, chronomat watches, every NFL team, all 32 represented. It's the 104th year anniversary of the NFL, and they are celebrating it like nobody else. Breitling Boutique, International Plaza Mall. Thanks for listening. For Steve Burstick, I'm Rick Stroud of the Tampa Bay Times. Have a great day, everybody. 